all the men who had explained the universe before Newton believed the universe had a spiritual side, not that Newton was in any way an atheist or in any way an ungodly man. He was a believer. That is, he believed in God. No, he did not believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ, but he believed in God. But nevertheless, his explanation of the universe seemed to mean that the universe could run all by itself without a guiding hand. Now, folks, let me hasten before I proceed any farther. When I'm talking about these, the philosophy, uh, the philosophs who will come next, I don't believe what they said. But nevertheless, I have to teach about what they said. So Newton, uh, he they, they, they began to compare the universe to a mechanical clock. Once you set the clock in motion, the clock will run by itself without you standing there and constantly moving the clock. Now, the clocks they knew about were what we might call the today's cuckoo clocks. When you're familiar with a cuckoo clock, we have to raise up the pine cones and then the clock will just stick talk all day until 24 hours later the pine cones come all the way to the floor they have to raise it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Maybe a few, maybe most of you don't, but uh, anyway, my parents liked the old timey cuckoo clock and they had several of them and the problem was the clock would never be accurate more than five minutes uh, a day. Um, but anyway, the clock could run itself except you had to, um, you had to set the pine cones in motion. You had to adjust the uh, pendulum, but other than that, the clock would run itself. Well, the universe then seemed to be able to run itself. This led to a religion called deism. Very important to what came later. Deism said that God had made the universe, but after that, he had just left the universe to run itself and did not interfere very often in the affairs of the universe. In other words, now, the folk where this was to eventually lead was a belief that the universe, if the universe could run itself, then somehow the universe could put itself together. If you can believe that a mechanical clock can just put itself together, because it can run itself, it can put itself together also. Oh yeah, hey, the word automobile means self-moving. Hopefully, you'll never let one run by itself. Well, they've got to invent something. All you do is dial, and the car will take you where you want to go. But uh, that technology is fast approaching. But anyway, even then, it would not put itself together. All right. you what I said last time, Newton's law of gravity does not seem to work outside the solar system. It works pretty well for bodies inside, then you go outside and it just seems like there's not enough matter. The stars are too distant from the center of the galaxy, and the center of the galaxy doesn't seem to have enough matter to create enough gravity to hold a big galaxy together. And uh, what do the scientists do? Well, they postulate there must be a whole bunch of dark matter. And then when they see the, some of the distant galaxies moving, some of them toward us and away from us, they begin to postulate there must be a whole bunch of dark energy because they can't see any kind of energy that makes these galaxies move. So it must be energy that we can't detect. Um, again, folk, all that we know about the universe outside our own solar system can be summed up in one word. Remember what that word is? Nothing. Nothing. Basically, I mean, hey, it's a good thing we're observing it, but. All right. So much for the reform in science. The reform in religion led to a reform in science, and the reform in science then led to changes in our philosophy. Now, this word might look like it's misspelled, but actually it's a French word, and it is properly spelled. It's pronounced philosaphs. The philosaphs 
and for many years I was mispronouncing pronouncing it, but your book gives the pronunciation of Spiegel's Ops. These, this is the name given to the Enlightenment philosophers of the 16 and 1700s. All right, you notice I called them Enlightenment. This time period, known as the Enlightenment, um, essentially it was where that mankind began to change and they moved away from religion and more toward philosophy, more towards the scientific method. And this is something your book not mentioned, but to me it's very important. This is where the concept of rights came in, among other things that the Enlightenment brought about. Rights. In other words, before this time, people had responsibilities. You shall not kill, you shall not steal, or no, you were responsible. But during this time, you had rights. You, know, you had a right to uh, this, that, and the other. And of course, where this was to lead is the idea that you have a right to a free public education, a right to, I mean, just name it, to have all kinds of rights. Um, but that's where this was to eventually lead, the, the concept of rights. All right, now, this next part is going to be a little difficult to try to match up these various philosophes with their ideas. First one we talk about is Descartes, Rene Descartes. Obviously you can tell he was French. His name is not pronounced the way it's spelled, at least not in English. He's famous for, uh, among other things, separating mind from matter. But he's also famous for the saying, I think, therefore I am. Um, if I think it, or if I think I exist, if I have consciousness, that means I exist. In fact, there's a story going around at one time, he was at a cafe and a waitress came up to him and said, do you want another drink? And he said, I think not. He vanished, ceased to exist. He thinks not, so he doesn't exist anymore. Um, I think, therefore I am. Um, next one. Oh yes, your book then goes into a digress between what happened they compare Europe to China, and they ask the question, why didn't China experience a scientific revolution? Now, uh, quote, it's just been yesterday, yesterday morning, that uh, I compared Europe to China and got some young woman very much offended at me because I, she said, I promise you, this, the founder of our faith did not quelch scientific discoveries. I'm not saying he did it, but apparently somebody somewhere in that part of the world did quilch discoveries, or at least, uh, anyway, uh, in your comparison of the Chinese to the Europeans, it seems like the Chinese were not interested in such things as mechanical clocks. And if you know anything about how mechanical clock works, you have to have gears, and the gears will have a ratio of 60 to 1, 60 seconds. And the second hand moves 60 times faster than the minute hand. The minute hand moves uh, about 60 times faster than the hour hand, and the hour hand goes around all the way around once every 12 hours. Um, gears. And again, the, the Chinese just didn't have a concept of uh, creating something like this. The Europeans did. The mechanical clock was one of the first of the complex European inventions that was to lead eventually to the invention of such things as a steam engine, the automobile, and even the computer, the airplane, uh, jump, jump far enough ahead. 
Du Bois said historians don't know for sure why the Chinese didn't progress. Um, and one historian even suggested the Chinese had a thing called the civil service exam, which I haven't mentioned until now. The civil service exam meant that if you did well on that exam, you could get a high government position. But who's to say that a high government position is the best way to get to the top? What about achieving in the areas of science or achieving in the areas of, uh, well, even sports or music or the arts? And um, the Chinese only emphasized, well, you know, if you want to get ahead, get a high government position, and not if you want to get ahead or achieve, become a great scientist, become a great industrialist. Personally, here's one thing I think. I think that the Chinese problem was that we united. Now, if China had been split up into 50 different countries, like Europe was, speaking about 40 different languages, one of those countries might have been able to forge ahead and, and drag the elements with it. Europe was divided into more than 100 different kingdoms, dukedoms, counties, some loosely united and some not united at all. That way they had a better chance that one of them would give their people enough freedom to inquire and give their people to, to forge ahead. Uh, inquiry. Scientific discoveries are made by persons who say, hey, the way we've been doing things is wrong, who dis persons who disagree from the norm. And it's time we turned around and changed things and then things are right. Or did things a different way. Alright. Now, we've, your book then goes in onto the Enlightenment. The people of the Enlightenment believed in the scientific method, among other things, and here they reasoned that if science could make us have better inventions or make better gadgets, then the scientific method could be used to create a better government. Essentially, they believed that if you boiled a pot of water to a certain temperature, I mean, if you, if you heated a pot of water to a certain temperature, it boiled, and then went over here and heated the next pot to the same temperature, and it boiled, well, hey, there is regularity, and hey, I agree, yeah, there's regularity, then, if that be true, then you put a bunch of pupils in the same classroom with the same teacher, with the same temperature and same humidity, same air pressure, and all that, we're going to make the same grade. Or you get a society and get just the right type of government with the right kind of ruler, and that automatically guarantees this society will be an orderly society. Won't have any problems because we found out the right kind of person who should lead and the right kind of persons who should surround him. And, you know, hey, uh, sounds great. To this day, we have not found the right method. It's a scientific method. Um, that reason could govern human society, and with this I'll close. The most famous beginning theoretician, theor theoretician was John Locke. I mean, I say beginning, he started it out. John Locke told us that from the time a person is born, his mind is a blank and just waiting to be written on. A big blank mind, waiting to be written on, and that a person then is the product of his environment. Now, you put a person in a really good environment, he'll turn out to be a good, upright citizen, hardworking, upright, morally upright citizen. Put a person in a bad environment, and he might turn out to be an outlaw. Again, each of you can make up your mind for yourself. But throughout history, we've discovered that, um, hey, some people grew up in a really good environment and turned out lousy. Others grew up in a really bad environment and turned out to, to be productive, honest, upright, hardworking citizens. Um, hey, my daughter and I got together one time, and I mean, I've always enjoyed, believe it or not, reading about bad men. And she, I found out she was reading about John Dillinger and Al Capone. 
I said, yeah, I encourage her, go ahead. And I would, I would read with her about Jesse James. Now, Babyface Nelson, I mean, uh, hey, are any of you familiar with these guys? What do you know about them? Bonnie and Clyde, anybody, anybody heard of these men or women? They're gangsters. They're gangsters. Basically, they're, they're a bad person. I said, some people used to think that they could study these people and come to the conclusion of what made them turn bad. The fact is, oh, you can't. What made them turn bad? Because Locke was wrong. Each of us have a free will. Well, at least I think so. If you think differently, you're welcome to say so. And we make up our own minds what we're going to be. And we're not totally the product of our society. All right. 